Well, now to our special series on the future of health care globally. Antimicrobial resistance is becoming a major political, social, and economic problem. Specialists say that if no immediate action is taken, about 5 million people are going to die every year in Asia by 2050 from conditions linked to bacterial infections resistant to antibiotics. Joining us now from L.A. to discuss all of this is Jonathan Thomas, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, the chairman of that. Jonathan, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, if it is this resistance is so threatening, why is there not more attention paid to this? You know, that's a great question because it is a really major looming disaster that's really flown basically under the radar. As it currently stands here in the United States, there are two million illnesses a year in hospitals of which are caused by antimicrobial resistance and of those 23,000 deaths. We've already begun to see certain of the last lines of defense which would be things like carbapenems or colistin that have now been shown to be ineffective against certain bacteria that have mutated to the point where they no longer respond to those drugs. Mm. Once that happens and starts to spread, it's going to be a major, major problem. And for some reason, it's just not getting the same focus that other diseases or conditions are getting. And it's not just media focus or public attention focus. What about among drug makers, pharmaceutical companies? What kind of pipeline do we have uh, to, to combat this? Well, we've got very little pipeline. Uh, the big issue for pharmaceutical companies is it just is not economically feasible for them to develop new antibiotics. If you think about it, it costs the same, roughly by today's estimates, a billion dollars to create a new drug. Costs the same to create an antibiotic that is going to be used intermittently and will be cheaply priced as it does to produce the next Lipitor, which is much more expensive and will be something you have to take for the rest of your life every single day. So if you're a pharmaceutical company faced with those options, you would naturally choose the one that's going to give you a much more lucrative return on your investment. We've seen over the years, unfortunately, since the heyday of antibiotics in the 40s to the 60s, which was really the golden era, pharma, one right. after the other, has fleet, fleed the space. And that's a real issue. John, uh, how, in your view, can research be incentivized for some of these big pharma companies right now? Is there one solution that can fix it all? Uh, unfortunately, nobody's hit on it, and even more unfortunately, there aren't enough people discussing it. There have been a number of ideas thrown around. You need to have economic incentives to make this work. Uh, there have been a number of things proposed, uh, for example, the concept of a market entry reward where a pharmaceutical company developing an antibiotic would be paid an upfront sum for, say, three to four years after approval uh, and be allowed to charge for that drug on the open market. Uh, and once the three to four years lapsed, then they could raise the prices on that, and that would be something that would give them a uh, greater return. Uh, that has been just an idea to this point. It has not yet been implemented. Another idea would be to have fixed contracts with major buyers. Uh, the government would be a great example, whether it's the Department of Defense or BARDA or whatever. A third idea that's been floated, similarly not implemented, is the notion of a patent voucher. The uh, concept mm. there is basically when you have a drug that is approved that you've developed that's on the CDC's list uh, of drugs affecting most wanted pathogens, uh, you would be given a voucher that would expedite the regulatory treatment of the next drug that you're developing, and that can save a lot of time and lead to a much greater and sooner return. And uh, by the way, these vouchers could be sold on a secondary market for uh, very large amounts of money. So these are some ideas that are floating around out there, but to date, uh, none of them have yet been implemented. And there's been some, I guess, differences when it comes to approaches when you take a look at it by region too, John. I mean, Europe at one time, they were focusing on simplifying clinical trials. Uh, U.S., they were looking at these research and development tax credits as well. Have these measures actually worked or have we just kind of scratched the surface? 
You know, uh, I, I don't really think uh, a lot has worked, quite frankly. Uh, Europe is ahead of everybody else. Uh, there have been a number of efforts over there uh, to try to uh, develop new drugs, to try to uh, address this issue of so-called stewardship, which is the overuse of antibiotics in humans and in animals. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue has risen to uh, a discussion topic at the highest levels. The G20 considered it, the UN General Assembly considered it. Uh, there have been a number of blue ribbon panel reports that have talked about these, including one that was commissioned by the White House, another by the UK, which was the McNeil Commission. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust has put out a, right. a, a great discussion. Uh, but. Uh, these are identifying the problems and suggesting solutions, but yeah. to this point, we've not gotten around to implementing them. Uh, John certainly sounds uh, like a struggle and certainly slow going. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, what area or which country, which region is most vulnerable to these superbugs? Well, I think that there, uh, quite frankly, a, a lot of things, as you know, have come out of Asia, and it's because uh, there are uh, sort of a combination of factors that combine to uh, to uh, place the, the the development of new pathogens at the forefront. So, for example, you've got uh, large um, uh, uh, livestock population which are uh, pools of uh, of, of, of different types of bacteria that, uh, because the livestock are getting the antibiotics uh, worldwide, not just in Asia, but particularly in Asia, where you've got lots of, for example, poultry farms, et cetera, right. they get antibiotics to help facilitate growth. And the more things are given antibiotics, the more opportunity there is for bacteria to mutate. And since there have not been any new classes of, uh, of uh, new antibiotics since basically the 80s. You've got decades of mutation going on. And in Asia, you have large numbers of people proximate to large numbers of livestock. It's a chance for uh, mutated bacteria to jump from animals to humans. Uh, and that's a, a real issue. I referred to colistin before, which is one of the antibiotics of last resort. Yeah. Uh, the, the first a real appearance of that came in Asia, right. where uh, a, a DNA plasmid, which has this mutated bacteria that was yeah. in a pig, hopped over to humans, and that uh, caused a, uh, an instance of, uh, of illness that was right. not treatable with colistin. And that is just something that's the tip of the iceberg.